Good morning. So welcome to the fourth week. So today we will be doing uh, Gaussian elimination, which is the start of uh, solving equation. Before looking at uh, today's topics, let's take a look at uh, how far we have come and where we are heading. The first three weeks we started with uh, the concept of linearity, how that led to the concept of vectors and matrices, and we defined some operations on them. Everything was geared towards understanding what linearity was and also to get used to the language of uh, linear algebra. So we finish with that. So today is the first class of uh, the next part of the book, which is the algebraic view, by which I mean solving equations. So today we will deal with uh, something called Gaussian elimination. And along the way, we will learn things like uh, the rank of a matrix. Next week, we will look at uh, inverses in a more formal and complete way. And today, we will also think about the solvability conditions of a system of linear equations. So that will complete this part of uh, the book in two weeks. And then we will move on to that is the geometry of linear algebra. We'll deal with vector spaces, dimensions, and uh, look at projection operations, etc. Then after that, using everything that we've learned thus far, we will be moving on to advanced topics. But the advanced topics are the ones that will be useful in computer science because those are the techniques that are used in computer science. So that's where we want to reach. So that's our learning journey. We are here now, just looking ahead to the algebraic view. Then the last three weeks, you will be doing your project presentations. So today's learning objective is to understand this, uh, this uh, idea of uh, Gaussian elimination and how to solve equations using something called back substitution. Then along the way, we'll define certain, thi certain things like the pivots of a matrix and uh, its rank, etc. And finally, we will uh, understand what a decomposition is of a matrix. It is when you write a matrix as a product of some other matrix, some other matrices. So A equal to P, a permutation matrix, L, a lower triangular matrix, U, an upper triangular matrix, is a PLU decomposition. And some people might call it just the LU decomposition also, because uh, P may not be necessary in uh, most cases. The idea is to be able to solve uh, systems of linear equations. As you know, a matrix actually represents a system of linear equations. What you have learned in high school might be something like, if you have as many equations as some nodes, you can solve them. But that's not quite true, we will see. Let's take a positive example where you can actually uh, solve them. So two equations and two unknowns. So x plus y equal to 5, x minus y equal to 1. Very simple set of equations. You know how to solve them. Actually, you can solve them using uh, your primary school uh, model kind of approach. But algebraically, also, you know, you can just add these two equations. You get uh, y and y will cancel. Mi y and minus y will cancel. Add them, you get 2x. And uh, 5 plus 1, 6. So that means x is equal to 3. And subtract them. x minus x is uh, 0. y minus minus y is a uh, 2y. And that becomes uh, 5 minus 1, 4. So you get uh, y equal to 2. So very easy to solve. You wouldn't actually do this using uh, Gaussian elimination or anything. So you can, it looks like you can solve two equations when you have uh, two unknowns. Why is that the case? What, what do these equations represent? So let's look at that in a, in a coordinate space. A one equation, which is a line, x plus y equal to 5. So when uh, x equal to 0, y equal to 5, when x, y equal to 0, x equal to 5, so two points are line. And I have another equation, x minus y equal to 1, so x equal to 0 will mean y equal to minus 1, and so on. So you get another line. They are nicely uh, uh, at an angle with each other, so they intersect at some point. And that point is common between these two lines, so that point satisfies both the equations. So you get uh, the, the red equation red equation and the blue equation satisfied and that point is x equal to 3 y equal to 2. So that's a solution. This is actually possible because these equations are what we will call independent and consistent. I haven't defined what I'm going to tell you that these equations are indeed independent and consistent. Now if you don't have two equations, you have only one equation and two unknowns, too few equations, does it have solutions? Yes, you can because you can find any value of x and y satisfying this will be a solution, right? So suppose I choose some value of x, say t, then y equal to 5 minus t, that is a solution because that is on the line that satisfies the equation. So any value of t in r 
is good enough and you have an infinity of such values so you have infinite solutions for this an infinity of solutions now let's look at another situation where i have two equations and two unknowns can you solve these two and how many solutions will you have two equations and two unknowns it might look as though you have two equations but if you look at it the second equation is just the first equation times two two times x two times y two times five and that is the second equation it's not there's no no more information there it's the same equation essentially really you have only one equation so it's the same as the previous case okay that is when i say that the equations are not independent these are dependent equations they're not independent there's only one real equation there okay so again choose any value for x equal to t and any value that will add up to that value of x to give you five will be a solution now let's look at one more situation where which kind of points to you that it's not always true that if you have as many equations as some nodes you can always solve so two equations again x plus y equal to five x plus y equal to 6. Two equations, two unknowns. Do you have solution? You don't because there's no pair of x and y that will give you, that will satisfy both the equations. The equations are inconsistent. That's what I mean by inconsistency. So let's see what happens there. They cannot be both true at the same time and there are no solutions. So let's see why. So the first equation x plus y equal to 5 is that line, the red one. The second one is another line parallel and they, they will never meet. So there will, be, there will never be a point in that space which will belong to both the lines and you cannot have a common point which, which means you cannot have a solution. So that's why there is no solution for that. So what we will say is that the equations are not consistent. They are inconsistent equations resulting in parallel lines. Now they don't really always have to be parallel. There are other ways of being inconsistent. Not so obvious in uh, R2. Suppose this was R3. You can have lines in R3 that are not parallel but still not meeting. For instance, R3, the same uh, picture here but the z-axis coming towards you out, out of the screen. And suppose my blue line was not parallel to red but it was filtered. It is actually parallel to the z-axis but going through the same point uh, 3, 3. That will never meet uh, the red line either. right? So there are ways in which you can have lines that do not meet but that are, that are not parallel in higher dimensions. So inconsistency can, can come in uh, many forms but this is the most obvious one. Now suppose you have too many equations. So let's, let me give you three equations. The first two are the same but I have one more equation. Now do you have solutions for the three equations here? Is there a point that is common to all three lines? Is there a pair of values x and y? which will satisfy all three, all three equations. It's the same as before. The reason is that the third equation is not independent. If you actually look at it, it's a linear combination. You don't really call equations linear combinations, but it's, it can be derived from the other two equations. Equation three really is equation one plus two times equation two. Y minus two Y, that is minus Y. Five plus two times one, that is seven. So it's actually just scaling the second equation by two and adding to the first equation. So you get a, something like a linear combination. And that is, uh, so that equation is not independent. Okay, it can be derived from the others. I have the first and second equations like that. And I have the third one, which is uh, the green equation, which happens to go through that uh, particular point. So I especially chose this equation such that it went through the special, special point, which is common to the red and the blue ones. So there is a solution to all three equations. They're consistent, but they're not independent. The, the, the green one is not independent of the other two, but they are all consistent. Okay? That's why they could be solved. Now, let me give you one more uh, permutation of uh, the situation. I again have uh, three equations. Now, the third equation looks similar, but in this case, instead of seven, I have nine, which means it's not really derived from the other two. The left-hand side is derived from the other two, but the right-hand side is not. The third equation is not consistent with the other two. So let's, the first red equation, the second blue equation, and the third green equation now doesn't go through the solution here, but it cuts the other two lines in some other points. So I get something like a triangle there. So there's no solution. So inconsistent equations, no single point of uh, intersection. So there's another way of being inconsistent. Although there is no solution, is there a way in which I can kind of say that there is an approximate solution or a point in this uh, space that kind of uh, best satisfies the three equations? 
or comes closest to satisfying the three equations. Is there such a point? Can you see such a point? Yeah, some somewhere inside the triangle, maybe something like the centroid of the triangle, equidistant from uh, all three points. That could you could probably think of that as the approximate solution, the best possible solution. It's not a solution. I cannot. I shouldn't really call it a solution because it is not in any one of the three lines, really. What is the best possible that you can uh, think of? That way of thinking actually leads to the idea of uh, linear regression. The machine learning technique called linear regression is exactly this. It's actually multiple lines and you're trying to figure out the best possible solution. Although you know that there is no real solution, trying to figure out the best possible solution and linear algebra will give you a very nice way of actually figuring out the best possible solution. So it, it leads naturally to some of the more powerful algorithms in, uh, in, uh, in machine learning naturally and elegantly. I had two equations in the beginning in the first example, nice equations, independent and consistent. So I had a solution. Now, the second example, I had only one equation. I had inf an infinity of solutions and it's not constrained enough. The system is not constrained enough to give me a single point. The third one looked like I had two equations, but the second one was not independent. Again, infinity of solutions because it was the same as the second uh, uh, example really. Then the fourth one, we started uh, running into trouble. Two equations again, but these equations were not consistent with each other. And they actually formed parallel lines in the, the coordinate space and no, no intersection, no solution. And then we went on to three equations. We have in this fifth example, we did have a, a solution because the third equation happened to be consistent, consistent with the rest of the, the equations. And it's not independent, but that was okay. It was consistent. In fact, it, with two variables, you cannot have a third equation that is uh, consistent and independent at the same time. The last permutation, the last example, was similar to the previous example, but the the last, the third equation was not consistent with the rest. Okay, again, inconsistent equations will mean no solutions. So we have a complicated situation here. So what they told you in high school that uh, if we have as many equations as an as in nodes, we can always solve them. It's not true. The best, the closest we can get to that statement is something like this. If we have as many consistent and independent equations as unknowns, we can uniquely solve them. We can get a unique solution. Okay. If not, if you don't have that, we don't really know what's going on. It, it depends. So we have to look at the system and then decide what's going to happen. This obviously is not a very satisfactory situation. We want to do better than this. So even for a very simple system of two equations, we had so many permutations. In our fifth and uh, in, in our last two examples, one was uh, the third equation in one was uh, consistent uh, with the other two. And in the fourth one, it was not. But if you have many more uh, variables and many more equations, it's very difficult to see what's consistent, what's inconsistent, etc. So that's what will happen when you go to Rn, 50 unknowns and 100 equations. Those are actually fairly small systems when uh, we are dealing with uh, any kind of physical system like all right so let's look at uh, how we can summarize what we know so far in r2 and r3 and uh, then going on to rn so we worked with two variables that means we were in r2 we could extrapolate that to r3 again we can probably visualize it then we will go on to rn where, where n is actually greater than 3 where we cannot really visualize it but we will extrapolate our mathematical intuition and insights into that also that's the game we play in uh, linear algebra we deal with uh, small systems or small number of dimensions which we can see and understand and then we extrapolate mathematically into something bigger and say that these things have to work there too. So if you have one equation in R2 what you have is a single line any point on the line is a solution to that equation so infinite number of solutions. If you have one equation in R3 what is it that you have see here so I have uh, R3 here x y and z and I'm going to give you an equation, uh, a simplest one I can think of, which is x equal to zero. That is a linear equation. What's the shape of that in this uh, coordinate space, in this uh, x, y, z space? If it was in R2, you know that it's going to be a line. x equal to zero is actually the y-axis. Here is the yz plane, right? So anything over here in this plane is a solution. So if I take uh, a vector zero, a vector zero, and some value for y and some other value for z and take this vector and this always satisfies x equal to 0 because x is really equal to 0. Okay, 
uh, yn does it can be anything so that's a solution to this so that means infinity of solutions any point on that plane is actually a solution if you go to a more complicated situation like x plus y plus z equal to one or three or something like that it's still a plane but oriented with respect to the axis in some orientation some general orientation but it's still a plane so one linear equation in r3 is a plane extrapolating if you have rn and if you have one equation then that becomes a hyper plane or a subspace or n minus one dimensional subspace so what's going on is this if you have an equation it is kind of like taking away one degree of freedom that you have so if you have if you are in r2 in r2 is a is a plane it's got two dimensions the moment i specify an equation it constrains you to it takes away one degree of freedom you can move only along that line and it basically gave you a one dimensional subspace a one dimensional i shouldn't call it a subspace to be very precise but some one dimensional entity in that space because it basically took away one degree of freedom similarly in r3 it take you take away one degree of freedom then you get a plane because you have two dimensions left in rn you have n minus one dimensions left which is like a hyperspace now if you have two independent and consistent equations in r2 i have taken away both the the degrees of freedom then what is left is a zero dimensional entity which is a point a unique solution that is common to both the equations the, the lines will intersect at some point that is the the common solution in r3 what's going to happen is that you have one plane by one equation and another plane by another equation and if the the equations are independent and consistent they are in some random orientation and two planes will intersect in a line so any point along the line is a solution so infinity of solutions in r and also infinity of solutions but what's going on there is much harder to visualize n minus two subspaces intersecting and infinity of solutions again now move on to three independent and consistent equations you cannot have that in uh, r2 you cannot find the third equation that is independent and consistent at the same time because you've run out of uh, dimensions there you don't have already have a zero dimensional entity that is a point that is a point of intersection there's nothing more you can do but in r3 if you have one equation that is one plane a second equation another plane cutting the first plane in a line and third equation at a general angle with respect to these two planes that will cut the line somewhere and that point becomes the solution to all three equations so it's a point a single unique solution in rn again infinity of solutions because you don't have enough constraints now extrapolating again n independent and consistent equations can never happen in r2 if n is more than three it cannot happen in r3 either because n is actually more than uh, three you cannot have a fourth consistent and independent equation in rn also what will happen is that you have just enough uh, equations to constrain everything you will get a single point of inter in uh, intersection if you have n independent good consistent equations so these are all situations where you have solutions now if you have two independent but inconsistent equations what you saw was that we had parallel lines in r2 in r3 you might get parallel planes so no solutions because parallel lines do not meet in r and also parallel subspaces so no solutions now three independent but inconsistent equations then life becomes more more complicated we saw this in our example in r2 we had a triangle we had the the red line the blue line and the green line forming a triangle okay so that is possible a triangle kind of intersection three intersection in three points i mean two parallel lines and uh, one line cutting them so intersection in two points is possible Interse no intersection at all three parallel lines that also is possible so many possibilities in uh, for three independent but in inconsistent equations in r3 also you could have parallel planes three parallel planes or two planes and uh, one so two planes and then another plane cutting this this is just an extension of the situation you have here or you have three planes intersecting in three different lines so they are not parallel to each other so but the intersection looks like three lines and that will make something like a triangular tube okay so no common point so no solutions but in r n it becomes much harder to visualize but you can say that similar things are going to happen there also in particular you can say that there are no solutions so inconsistency the moment you have inconsistency you know that you will not have solutions so same situation lines that make one of some of these things or maybe maybe even more complicated things same thing here lines that are planes that are parallel or with complicated shapes similar to this but 
because you have more planes, you can make more complicated shapes, but no single point of intersection, no solution. In RN also, same, same story, but impossible to visualize really, and no solution. So this is my matrix of uh, different situations that can ha happen. Very complicated, right? Very complicated. Obviously, we need some way of summarizing this, uh, some way of uh, detecting the, the different situations. Now, before doing that, let's define what uh, independence is. If an equation cannot be derived from the rest, it's an independent equation. Now, consistency is a much harder concept to pin down. All I can say is that an inconsistent system of equation is the one that has no solutions. So that is cyclical because we're trying to solve systems of equations using the concept of consistency and defining consistency in terms of the existence of the solutions. So it's cyclical, but that's what you have. Okay, but you know what it means though. We know that two lines are parallel. They are actually inconsistent e equations, etc. You know what it means, but hard to actually put it down in uh, words. Now, the statement is that the number of independent equations in a consistent system uh, can never be greater than the number of unknowns. You cannot have three consistent and independent equations if you have only two variables. Why that is the case is the situation is actually similar to the idea that uh, two linearly independent vectors will span R2, a third vector will necessarily be linearly dependent on these two linearly independent vectors that we saw. It's actually the same situation except that it's a transpose of uh, transpose case, we're talking about rows rather than columns, but it's basically the same idea. If a system has more independent equations than unknowns, if you, if you have a system where you have more independent equations than unknowns, so if you have three equations and two unknowns, the third equation will have to be necessarily in inconsistent if it is independent. We cannot really say anything if you just look at the system of linear equations. We cannot say whether there, there are solutions, there's a unique solution, infinity of solution. We cannot say any of those things without actually solving it, without actually starting to work on them, which is not ideal. We want to have some way of uh, doing this, especially we want to be able to use a computer to do this. So we need some kind of an algorithm to determine these things fast and that is that algorithm is called Gaussian elimination. So as you know a system of linear equations can be written as a matrix equation and on the matrix we can define certain operations called the elementary row operations which will transform the the matrix without changing the the solutions or the sol solvability conditions. So what it means is that the moment you have a system of a uh, linear equations in terms of x, y, z or x1, x2, x3, etc. that cast it in the matrix vector form. So this is what it is. If you have m equations and n unknowns, what you will do is to create a matrix A that has got m rows, as many rows as equations and as many columns as the unknowns. And then you will write x, which is, a, which is your unknowns, so x, y, z or x1, x2, x3, etc. equal to a constant. What you will have is a x equal to b a is just numbers b is just numbers and x is a, a vector of unknowns it will be the system of linear equations written nicely in the form of a, of a matrix and a couple of vectors so as you can see the matrix a comes from the coefficients of the equ the equations if you have linear equations each equation is of the form some number times x plus some number times y those some numbers are called a coefficients and A is a collection of those coefficients in the right places. And B will be the right, the right hand side of the equations and that would be just constants. So remember our equations are always in the form expression equal to constant. So the expression now is really this and the, the constant is that, is a constant vector. Okay. Now since A and B are just numbers now, you can think of feeding them into a computer and then doing manipulations on the numbers and getting a computer to tell you more about the solv solvability of the equations and maybe even solve the equations for you. So let me define the elementary row operations that we will be performing. As you know, each row in AX equal to B is an, is an equation. It stands for an equation. What can we do with equations when you're trying to solve them? You can add or subtract any of the equations. You can scale an equation by any number. So you multiply the left hand side and right hand side by some number. The equation is still valid. So for instance, if I have these two equations, the uh, original equations, x plus y equal to 5, x minus y equal to 1, I can subtract the first equation from the second one 
and minus y minus y again minus 2y and then I can get uh, y so that's one way of solving it now corresponding to these uh, operations the algebraic manipulations that you can do on equations you can define row operations on the matrix on the coefficient and constant matrix really so you can swap any two rows you can multiply a row by a, a scalar that will still be a valid equation you can add a multiple of a row to another row remember you cannot be silly here what i said here is add a multiple of a row to another row to another row so if you add a multiple of a row to the same row essentially you're just scaling that equation so that is the same as the second operation and if you take the negative of a row multiply the row by minus one and add to itself you're kind of killing the equation you will get zero equal to zero that uh, kind of you lost information similarly if you multiply a row by a scalar which is zero then you get zero equal to zero which is a valid equation but it's a useless equation you lost information so those things you, you shouldn't do now in our algorithm Gaussian elimination we will not be using uh, the second elementary row operation so that's why that is in gray so the important point is that by doing any one of these elementary row operations or a multiple of them the the solutions are not changed and the solvability conditions are not changed and also if you think about it if you just do the third operation not the first one or the second one and if the coefficient matrix a happens to be a square matrix then you have a determinant and the determinant doesn't change this was our uh, like property six or something in the properties of determinants add a multiple of a row to another row the determinant doesn't change so determinant is unchanged if you just do the third operation so let's take our equations and cast them in uh, the matrix form so our equation was x1 plus y sorry x plus y equal to 5 so 1 times x plus 1 times y equal to 5 x minus y 1 times x minus 1 times y is equal to 1 so those are the two equations written in the matrix form now i'm going to do eros elementary row operations on these but then obviously whatever i do on the left hand side i have to do on the constants part also whatever i do to these guys i have to do the same things to these guys also otherwise the equation is no longer an, or a true statement because you're modifying only one side so whatever you need to do the coefficient matrix a will need to be done to the, the constants matrix b constants vector b and for that reason we can create something called the augmented matrix we'll just put five and one along with a and call it a different matrix a b the, the augmented matrix okay so that's my equation in matrix form so that's my equation in the raw form linear equations and i create an augmented matrix which i write having the coefficient part here and a bar here and then the constants part here the bar is optional when you do this in a, in sage math or something sage math will put bar if you ask it to do so but in inside the algorithm inside the program the bar is not used it's only for visualization purpose so that you know that you augmented it then you will do some elementary row operation here what i'll do is to subtract the first row from the second row so that i kill the second row first element and that's all i want to do with this simple matrix if i had one more row i would subtract some scale version of the first row from the third row also so that that element also is zero i will basically kill the first elements of all the rows below me below the first row using the first row by multiplying scaling the first row and then subtracting or adding similarly in the next step i will use a second row it's already got the first uh, element zero then i'll use a second element and kill all the elements below that that's my plan now what is left the first non-zero element that is left in each row is called the pivot and this form is called the row echelon form which is basically an upper triangular matrix there by doing eros elementary row operations and then i'm going to define one more concept the rank of a matrix which is the number of uh, pivots so here i have uh, two pivots in uh, blue and so the number of pivots is two and that is the rank of the matrix so what i want is this all rows with zero elements if there are such rows will have to be at the bottom of the matrix and in each row the first zero element of any row is strictly to the right of the first non-zero element in uh, the row above it first non-zero element in any row is strictly to the right of the first non-zero element in the row above it which means if i have the one one column some number that is non-zero in the second row i cannot have a non-zero element in the in the first column so basically what it is saying is that uh, is that it should be upper triangular so this is a uh, one example where i have 
pivot this also should have been in red so this also should have been in red so that is one pivot there's a second pivot i have two pivots and the rank is two and the second row has the first non-zero element which is called the pivot to the right of the non-zero element in the first row so this is this uh, satisfies the second row this one is satisfied so this is a uh, in ref row echelon form it's called row echelon because in french echelon means stairs or steps so this is like steps so this is another example where i have uh, four pivots it's a four by four matrix it's four pivots okay so it is in row echelon form how about this guy it also does it's just that in the second column i don't have a pivot so it's still a step like this is in echelon form just that my this guy doesn't have a pivot the pivot happens to be in the third column okay again this is not a square matrix here how about this guy this also is in row echelon form because i got my steps here all is fine with it the last example there how about this guy this also is in row echelon form it has a row of zeros in the bottom so it the row the row of zeros is in the bottom so it satisfies the first condition and it satisfies the second condition too so those are the different uh, examples if i had this row if i if i swap these two then obviously that won't be in the row echelon form now let me define the pivots and uh, ranks once more the leading non-zero element in a row of a matrix in its row echelon form that is the pivot it's also called the leading coefficient for obvious reasons so any column that has a pivot is called a pivot column if there is a column without a pivot that is a non-pivot column and all rows will have pivots because that's the definition of pivot or it could be an all zero row that is possible that doesn't have a pivot so all rows are either pivot rows or zero rows now the rank is the number of pivots in a matrix in its ref that is the definition of rank now we will have different definitions of ranks starting uh, even next week we'll have a slightly different definition the week after that there will be some other definition but it's all equ equivalent but it's just viewing the the matrix and uh, its properties from different perspectives okay so rank of a if you have m rows and n columns the best you can have is a pivot in each column and obviously you cannot have more pivots than the rows either because each row will have only it has a leading non-zero element or it's all zero you cannot have more than the minimum of uh, number of rows and number of columns as the rank so for a three by four matrix the maximum possible rank you can have is three can be could be less than three if a rank of a matrix is the minimum of the number of rows and columns it is a full rank matrix if it is not then the rank is deficient and the rank deficiency is the maximum possible rank it can have minus the actual rank it does have all right now let's talk about a gaussian elimination it's also known as a row reduction so it is an algorithm to reduce a matrix a coefficient matrix to its uh, row echelon form using the three operations that we specified so the three operations are these three but we are not going to use the second one here so this guy is not used and even this one the swapping of the row, the two rows we'll do it only when we have to so the third one is uh, where the game is adding a multiple of any row to another but you know that that doesn't change the determinant of the matrix which is kind of important because determinant has something to say about the singularity of the matrix if it is a square matrix all right so using the third ero and the first ero we are trying to reduce a matrix to its uh, row echelon form that is the game so the third one does not change the determinant if you review the properties of the determinants you will see it and the solution is unchanged because the row operations are just algebraic manipulations of the equations the row reduction or the gaussian elimination is usually done on the augmented matrix because you're trying to solve the equations all right so let's look at the algorithm here use the first row of the first equation to kill the first element in each row so that is possible if the first element in the first row has a non-zero element you can always take scale versions of that and subtract it from the rows below and kill all the first elements in all the rows uh, below that is always possible if it is not possible which means the first element in the first equation is not non-zero it is actually zero then you cannot scale it and subtract and uh, hope to kill any other element so at that point you will have to swap for two rows and after doing that you take the second row and use its leading element which is the pivot leading uh, coefficient which is the pivot because the first element is already zero the second element will be non-zero use that to kill all the rows uh, below that and so on you just do that and you can actually write it up as an algorithm you will see that what you're doing is in the second step you have a slightly smaller matrix than the first one 
one fewer columns and uh, one fewer rows and you call that the original matrix and then you use the same iteratively com complete uh, until you run out of rows and columns you just keep doing it so the result will be an upper triangular matrix which is the row echelon form of uh, a or the augmented matrix once we have the the row echelon form then we can start talking about the solvability now looking at uh, the gaussian elimination result which is the ref and let's look at the solvability okay so the statement is here i am state going to state these things without proof so if the ref of the augmented matrix has a zero row a row of zeros on the the a side which is the coefficient side equaling to a non-zero on the the constant side on the b side so i have a zero 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 in the bottom row somewhere here but a non-zero element here that's when we have inconsistency that's how you detect inconsistency the moment you have inconsistency you know that there are no solutions so you stop at that point okay so you give up no point continuing or trying to solve anymore if not if you have no such uh, uh, rows of zeros equating non-zeros then you do have solutions then you can look at uh, the number of pivots which is a rank of the ref if it is, if it is equal to the number of variables that means you have just just the right number of uh, uh, consistent and independent equations to solve then you have a unique solution the number of pivots rank equal to the number of variables means unique solution if not you will have an infinity of solutions and there is no situation where you have the number of pivots greater than the number of variables because that means the number of pivots more than the number of columns that can never happen i stated this without actually telling you why it is true so let's take a look at uh, the examples then you will see why this comes about so this is again for my original set of uh, uh, equations i start with uh, a consistent independent set of equations two equations two unknowns i do the augmented matrix i find ref and uh, it doesn't have a zero equal to non-zero row that means it's solvable and what's the rank i have two pivots here so rank is two and two unknowns number of unknowns is two so i have a unique solution the second situation i had only one uh, equation so i have my augmented matrix like this there's no row below so this is already in the ref in the row echelon form and obviously it doesn't have zero equal to non-zero kind of row so it is solvable what's the rank of this guy there's only one pivot but i have two unknowns so the rank is less than the number of variables so i have infinity of solutions the third situation so this is something where we have to pay attention i have two equations and how do i get rid of the second uh, uh, second row first column element i want to get rid of this guy so i scale the first row by two and subtract from the second row so that becomes zero but then this also becomes zero and that also becomes zero so i, ha I have a zero row but zero is not equal to non-zero here it just says zero equal to zero so there is no inconsistency the system is still consistent but what's the rank now only one non-zero pivot only one pivot rather and two unknowns still so infinity of solutions the okay, rank is less than uh, the number of variables infinity of solutions the third the next example here this is the inconsistent situation again i want to get rid of uh, this one here so i just subtract the first row from the second so this goes away so i get zero there the second guy also goes away i get zero there but the the augmented side the constant side i get six minus five i get one so i do have zero equal to non-zero row so that points to inconsistency that's how it comes about that means this is not solvable i don't worry about the the rank or anything now if you have three equations again i want to get rid of this guy so i subtract the first one from the second so i get a minus two i want to get of, get rid of this guy so i subtract three times that from this guy three times that from this guy so i get uh, zero here or what do i get here minus one minus uh, three so i have actually have minus four here and three times five fifteen minus uh, 7 minus 15 so I have minus 8 here so that's I have that's what I have after the first row operation then I use minus 2 here to get rid of minus 4 so I multiply by 2 and subtract from here so that becomes 0 I sub multiply by 2 here so I get minus 8 subtract from minus 8 I get 0 there also so I see that I have no inconsistency because I have no 0 equal to non-zero there so it is solvable and again the rank is uh the rank is uh oh no my computer is overheating the rank is uh one one plus one so one pivot plus another pivot so two 
rank is 2 which is the same as the number of variables so I have a unique solution okay, so even this case is uh, completely handled I play the same game here I play the same game here now what I get in the last row is a 0 equal to non zero that means inconsistency not solvable so the complexity in the system of linear equations can be kind of uh, assessed and understood in once you get the REF, which is the result of uh, Gaussian elimination. Okay, so let's uh, repeat what I said about the Gaussian elimination because now I explained it using examples. Now you can probably see it. So if the the row echelon form of the augmented matrix has a zero of rows on the coefficient side a side equaling to a non-zero on the b side, the constant side, then we have inconsistency, no solutions, we give up. Okay, otherwise we look at the number of pivots in the row echelon form which is the rank of the matrix of the augmented matrix okay if it is the same as the number of variables then we have just enough uh, equations to solve perfectly you have a unique solution and if the number of pivots is smaller than the number of variables then you have an infinity of solutions and the number of pivots can never be greater than the number of variables because the number of uh, variables is the same as the number of columns and you cannot have more pivots than uh, the columns. The primary reason why we do Gaussian elimination, of course, is to solve for systems of linear equations. All right. But along the way, we also get uh, pivots and ranks. So REF, the row echelon form, will give you the pivots right away because after the row reduction, after Gaussian elimination, you have the REF that where you see the pivots right away. You don't really have to do any, any extra work. And the number of pivots will be the rank. So the rank, rank also is uh, given by by uh, Gaussian elimination okay now although we are doing only row reduction meaning we are only doing uh, EROs uh, elementary row operations you could think of doing elementary column operations for some other purpose uh, for the pu purpose of finding pivots and ranks for instance but that will not give you the solutions to uh, the same set of equations because when you do column operations then the solutions will change but there is a theorem that states that uh, if you find the number of pivots using row operations or by using column operations you get the same number the row rank is the same as the column rank that is a theorem and uh, we will actually see why that is true either next week or some i don't remember where i put it but most likely next week we will see why that is true okay and uh, but that is a theorem in uh, in linear algebra one of the famous ones okay but the column reduction can also be thought of as taking the matrix a taking its transpose and then doing the the row operations it's the same thing so the row rank is the same as the column rank okay and we saw that the rank is the minimum of the number of uh, rows and the number of columns number of columns is the number of uh, variables number of rows is the number of equations okay so the rank of a cannot be greater than the number of unknowns or it cannot be greater than the number of equations either okay if the rank is the same as the number of equations then you have a unique solution it cannot be more but if it is equal then you have the the situation where you have a unique solution now in order to get the determinant you can do determinants by using uh, uh, the output of uh, gaussian elimination which is the ref because there are all operations the third row operation i should say does not change the property uh, it has a property that it does not change the determinant by the properties of the determinant that is the third row operation is taking a multiple of a row and adding it to another row that does not change the determinant it doesn't change the sign or the or the value of the determinant but if you swap two rows then uh, you might introduce and you will introduce a negative sign if you swap two rows if you swap it two rows two times then you will cancel off the negative sign okay so ref will give you an upper triangular matrix for a square matrix if, if the upper triangular matrix is a full rank one meaning it's got pivots in every column and every row and then the determinant is just the product of the of diagonal elements which is uh, everything below that is zero upper triangular matrix the product of diagonal elements that is the determinant and if it is not full rank at least one row will not have a pivot in the the same column not on the diagonal pivot will be to the right of the diagonal which means that diagonal element is going to be uh, zero then the product will be zero the determinant is going to be zero so if i have such a situation it's a square matrix and I have a zero here so that immediately tells me that uh, uh, the determinant is zero because the determinant is the product of uh, this guy this guy this guy and this guy 
and if there is a zero along the diagonal then the determinant is zero but it can be seen in another way also saying that uh, the rank of this matrix is the number of the number of pivots so this guy one two three so the rank is three and uh, the maximum possible rank is four so it's rank deficient so it's uh, determined is zero because by by the fact that it doesn't have enough rank also so product of uh, the diagonal elements so if you want to find the determinant the best way of doing it the easiest not the easiest for human beings but uh, the most efficient way of doing it using a computer is to actually do gaussian elimination after that is just a multiplication okay so if you want to compute the determinant of a matrix a four by four matrix like this it is a horrible computation if you want to do it by hand you have to take this element if you are expanding along the top row then the sub matrix here and find its determinant which means you have to find the sub matrix here that determinant multiplier it's a horrible computation the laplace expansion is a is not easy to do it will be fairly impossible for a human being to do without making an arithmetic error even if you have a calculator but if you ask a computer to do it if you ask sage maths to do it it doesn't do it that way because that is inefficient what it does is actually it does ref first okay and it computes the the product of the diagonal elements and it knows that that is the the determinant of a within a sign it could be plus or minus because if it if the computation of ref required uh, the program to do a row exchange then it's actually negative but it will keep track of the number of times it did the row exchange also and it'll give you the determinant that is the way it is done and that is the most efficient way of doing it okay all right now what we have after gaussian elimination is a uh, is uh, an upper triangular matrix but we don't we still don't have the solution so we have to find the solution now so that is the next step that is done by something called back substitution so let me tell you what it is okay so the primary objective was to solve a system of linear equations we got the ref which is an upper triangular matrix so what we will do is take the last row the last non zero row in the upper triangular matrix and that basically has only one element on the uh, on the coefficient side and only one element or one value on the constant side so that basically solves one variable and use that in the previous row and uh, then you get the second last variable and then you keep going up so in order to do the row elimination in order to get get to the ref you go down the matrix once and then in, after that you go up the matrix using back substitution to get all the the variables back so i'll show you an example then it'll become clearer okay so you you use the last non-zero row to get the solution of the last variable and then you'll keep going up okay so you iterate until you, until you run out of uh, variables so let's look at an example so this is our first very first example we get uh, the augmented matrix and you subtract the first row from the second to get the ref there's only one operation you get the ref already okay so two pivots and the rank is two that means full rank that means a unique solution now use the the last row the last row basically reads the second variable times minus two is equal to minus four so minus two y is equal to minus four that means y equal to four so you use that to get y and then you just subtract it in the in the previous row okay back substitute in the row number one so y x plus y is equal to five that means x plus two equal to y because y is two and then you get three so that's how that's a systematic way uh, the algorithm works that's how it gets the solutions okay now we said that in some cases we might have an infinity of solutions so we had to find the infinity of solutions we have to characterize the solution and you have to write it down somehow that would be the complete solution let's see how that is done so that will happen when the number of variables is num more than the number of equations typically so i have three variables here x y and z but i have only two equations so first thing i do is to create the augmented matrix so x plus y plus z equal to 6 1 1 1 and 6 1 1 1 and 6 2 2 1 and 9 so i get the augmented matrix there then i find uh, the ref so i take twice the first row subtract from the second row so this guy goes away this guy gets killed and this twice the first row from the second row so minus 2 plus 1 so minus 1 there okay minus 12 plus 9 so minus 3 there so i get my row echelon form my pivots are here two pivots okay and three are known so i i'm going to get an infinity of solutions no no inconsistency no zero equal to non-zero 
so I'm going to get an infinity of solutions. Now my trick is to say that there is a pivotless column. This column is got no pivot. I'm going to keep that variable, the variable corresponding to the pivotless column, to be free. I'll say that that variable can take any value. That variable can take any value. Okay, and then I'll try to solve for the rest. So let's take the last uh, row as before. So that reads minus z equal to minus three. That means z equal to three. So that is the meaning of the last row and back step substitute in the previous row and I'm going to keep y equal to zero. So I get x plus y plus three equal to three. That means uh, uh, x plus y plus three equal to six. That means x plus y equal to three and then I'll take y to be zero. Okay. If I take y to be zero, what I get as x is actually three. Then I have z equal to three, x equal to three. So I get this and this. Another way of looking at it is to say that uh, y can take any value, y can take any value and since it's a free variable, any value in R is okay for that. So let me take a general value t and then x is equal to 3 minus t because x plus y equal to 3. So it, x is just 3 minus t. So I can write that the complete set of solution like that x, y and z, x is equal to 3 minus t, y equal to, to t and z equal to 3 and then I can decompose it into two components one reads 3 0 3 and uh, the second one reads t times minus 1 times 1 and times 0 so that's the way you could do it now if you look at it the first one here is a solution to the to the two equations when y equal to 0 so if you set y equal to 0 I set y equal to 0 x is 3 x is 3, z is 3, so x plus z is uh, 6, that is fine. 2x is uh, 2 times 3, that is uh, 6, this is 0, and uh, z is 3, so 6 plus 3, 9. So it's a solution to the set of equations where the free variable is set to 0. That is my first vector there. The second vector is something that can be scaled by uh, a scalar, and any scale version of that vector can be added to this vector and that is still a solution right? which is what we saw which is the the freedom that you get by the fact that uh, you have a free variable infinity of solutions okay so that is what the complete solution is let's take a look at uh, okay maybe let's take a look at the next slide and then take a look at uh, what this means in in the coordinate space what exactly does is i what exactly does this give you all right so what i wrote is uh, i have these two equations and i have that solution and the solution had one constant vector and another vector times of uh, any number uh, a scale version of another vector so i'm going to call the constant vector my particular solution and the other vector my special solution which can be scaled by any scalar t so the solution is particular solution plus a scale version of the special special solution so that's what it is okay so xp is a particular solution and that is a solution as we saw when you set the free variable y to be zero and why why is y the free variable because that corresponds to the pivotless column in the ref okay now xs is one special solution and any scale version of that is a solution so xs that is uh, this vector that is one and any scale version of that is a is also a solution so there you have a vector of solutions okay all right so the question there is a question does does a spe special solution refer to the value t equal to 1 you could say that because i call this my special solution but any one of them can be considered a special solution if you want to have something that is a kind of quasi unique you might want to say that this vector basically gives you a direction so take the unit vector along that direction that might be called the special solution if you want but i'm not going to be nitpicky about it any one of them can be a special solution okay there are many special solutions each one of them is a, a scaled version of another okay that's what it means okay all right so complete solution is also called the general solution so complete solution is particular plus special solution times a scalar all right so i had one vector that is xp i had one xp that was like three zero three that was my xp that's some vector I'm not going to draw this to scale or anything. I'm just say, going to say that that is some vector. That is my 
uh, my uh, particular solution XP vector. Okay. Now I have a special solution XS. If I remember right, that was uh, was it minus one one zero or one minus one zero? It doesn't matter. It's just some other vector. Okay. Some other vector pointing in some other direction. Okay. To some other vector. And when I add a scale version of that to this. Basically, what I'm saying is that the scale version will all fall on that line of the special vector, special solution. And when I add a constant to it, I am moving that guy to the tip of this one. So I have a line through the tip of this one. Okay. And any vector that is from the origin to this line will be a solution. So I have a line of solutions. So in general, you have a particular solution plus one scale version of a one special solution, another scale version of a, another special solution, a linear combination of special solution. Suppose you have only two of them. Suppose you had only two of them. That would mean a plane. Two vectors and their linear combinations will form a plane going through the origin. And you're taking the particular solution and moving this plane to the tip of that particular solution. And the whole plane becomes a, becomes a, a, a general solution. So an infinity of solutions, but it's a plane of solutions. A plane where uh, all the vectors whose uh, tip falls on the plane will be a solution to the system. That is a general general case. So that's not a general case. That is a more general than what we discussed. The most general case is impossible to visualize because it's a subspace and all that. Okay. So a particular solution plus the linear combination is a of the special solutions. That is a general solution. Now, if you think about it, this I did not mention. Special solution is actually the solution to the equation ax equal to zero. So let me show this to you. My special solution is minus one, one, zero. And if I take this guy and put this to zero and take this guy, put this to zero and look at uh, x equal to minus one, y equal to one, z equal to zero. That is indeed true. And I take uh, this guy minus two, two, zero. That also is satisfied. So special solution solutions are solutions to ax equal to zero. And this one is called homogeneous system of equations because if you look at the system of equations, all the terms on the left and right are all of uh, the same order. Okay, everything has a uh, well, a same order or zero. Everything has order one in the variable. So x to the power one, y to the power one, z to the power one. So that is a linear homogeneous equation, like homogeneous polynomials that you might have uh, learned about. Like x squared plus xy plus uh, y squared is homogeneous in order two. X plus y is homogeneous in order one. Okay, so this this system is a homogeneous system of equations, and so the special solutions are also called homogeneous solutions for that reason. Okay, all right. So you don't understand. I just explained it to you, so you probably didn't understand before I said said it. Homogeneous solution is a special solution, and that is uh, the solution to. Uh, the homogeneous system of equation and the system of equation is called homogeneous because all the order is the same all terms have the same order there's no constant term okay all right now let's move on to the next topic which is uh, something called elementary operations elementary matrices these are the the uh, matrices that will implement the elementary row operations matrices that will implement elementary row operations now remember Elementary operations are row operations. You are swapping two rows or you're adding a multiple of a row to another. So basically what you're doing is taking linear combinations of the rows of a matrix. And from the row picture of uh, matrix multiplication, you know that uh, taking linear combinations of a matrix on the right in a product is the same as uh, multiplying by a matrix on the, on the left. I'll show you examples when it will become a little clearer. But for now, basically understand that I'm using the row picture to implement the row operations because I'm taking linear combinations of the rows of the matrix on the right. Okay. So each elementary operation is a multiplication on the left by some matrix, which I'm going to call EI, which is the elementary operator. It's called the elementary matrix. Okay. So I have to keep doing multiple operations. So each operation is a, is a multiplication. So I'll, I'll have a series of them. So I'll have many of them. So I'll have, I'll take the matrix A. Maybe I swap two rows or maybe add a multiple. So that is implemented by this and something else implemented by the second one. And all the way, I have K such operations and all K of them when multiplied will give me some 
some matrix E. Okay, that is the product of this matrix. And finally, what I'll get is an upper triangular matrix, which is the REF. So I have it specified what these guys are, which you will see some examples of in the next slide. Okay, so starting with this, okay, let's start with the simplest possible case that we did before. What we do, we had the augmented matrix. We want to subtract the first row from the second row. So what we are trying to do is to say that the second row here will have to be that's the current second row minus the previous first row. So the first row of the product, the first row of the product here, the first row of the product, uh, the green matrix here. So the first row is this guy here is is the same as the first row in the original matrix because first row we didn't do anything about. So first row is uh, a linear combination of the rows here. What kind of linear combination? One of the first row and zero of the second row. So one of the first row and zero of the second row. So that will give me the first row of the, the green matrix. Okay. I take the first row here, multiply that by one and take the second row here. I take multiply that by zero. So I get nothing of the second row, one of the first row and that is the first row of the green matrix here. That is a, the second one is more interesting. What am I planning to do here? I have to subtract the first row from the second one, subtract the first row. So that is minus one times the first row, minus one times the first row from the second row, not doing anything to the second row. So minus one times the first row, minus one times the first row and uh, one times the second row, subtracting the first row from the second. So the first row of the product is uh, one times the row one plus zero times the row two. The second row of the product U is minus one times the row one plus one times the row two. Okay, are you with me so far? So this is the row picture of matrix multiplication in action. Are you with me? So let me see some uh, some greens. Okay, good. Okay, let's let's look at a few more of them. Okay, suppose I wanted to swap the second and third row of a three by three matrix. Okay, so R three and R two, I want to swap them. How will I do this? So what I'll do is I'll write an elementary matrix like this. What does it say? In the product, what will happen is that I'll have as the first row one of the first row, zero of the second row, and zero of the third row. That means the product will have just the first row of whatever matrix I put here. I put A here, I have the first row of the A matrix in my product. In the second row, I take zero of the first row, zero of the second row, and just one of the third row. So the second row of the product will have the third row of A. And in the third row, I'll take zero of the first row, one of the second row, and zero of the third row. So in the third row of the product, I'll have the second row of A. So basically, I swapped row number two and three. In fact, if you look at the elementary matrix here, elementary operator here, what I did was to take the identity matrix and swap the second and third row in the identity matrix. That is exactly what it's going to do to any matrix. Okay. Now, what's the determinant of this guy? This elementary operation is a, is a permutation, it's permuting uh, two rows. And what's its determinant? Anybody? How would you know the determinant? What's the determinant of E1? Remember, if I swap two rows, determinant changes sign. What's the determinant of identity matrix? That is 1. Here I swapped a pair of rows, then I get minus 1, but which you can actually see. I take 1 and the determinant of this, which is a 0 times 0, minus 1 times 1, so that is minus 1, the whole thing minus 1, a uh, whole thing times 1, so that is minus 1. So I can actually calculate it. Okay, but you don't have to calculate because you're just swapping rows. Now, if I scale as the second row by a factor of four, what I'm planning to do is to replace in the product the second row by four times the current uh, current uh, second row. So I'll write the elementary matrix like that. Now let's multiply this by a and see what happens. What will happen is that I'll take in the product I'll have one of the first rows, zero of the second row, zero of the third row. So, so the first row is the same. The second row I'll have zero of the first row, four times the second row, and zero of the third row. So the second row gets scaled by four. The third row, zero of the first row, zero of the second row, one of the third row. So third row stays put, nothing changes there. So that is the implementation of scaling. So elementary matrix again. Now a more complicated one, subtract three times the first row from the third. Okay, so R3 is gonna be replaced by minus three R1 plus R3. So let's see how we can implement that. So this is my elementary matrix again I'm multiplying this uh, I'm multiplying a on the left by this elementary matrix so one times the first row zero times the second row zero times the third row the first row is the same 
Similarly, the second row is the same. Nothing happened in the second row. For the third row, I take minus 3 times the first row and uh, 0 times the second row and uh, 1 of the third row of the matrix A and that is going to be the, the third row of the product. So this guy implements exactly that minus 3 R1 plus R3. You can actually see this in the matrix. If you just look at the matrix, you can just read it out. It is just right standing right in front of you. Okay. That's the beauty of uh, the row picture. Okay. So what it does to the identity matrix is going to do to any matrix. So that's why we could just take the identity matrix and swap two rows and say that, okay, that's what's going to do to anything. So what you can say is that the elementary matrices all differ from the identity matrix by just one row operation. Here it was a swap. Here this was a scaling. Here this was some other elementary operation, which is three times the first row subtracting from the third row. Okay. So if you ignore this guy in uh, gray, because we're not going to use that, we can say that the third elementary operation does not change the the determinant because it's a, a, a scale version of a row subtracting or adding another row that does not change the determinant the first operation does change the determinant but uh, it's a sign change it's a swapping of two rows it's a sign change okay so for the f the first and third uh, elementary operations since they differ from the identity matrix in a way in which it doesn't change the determinant other than the sign you can say that the elementary operators will have determinants plus or minus one not counting the second one i'm not counting this guy this guy i'm not counting because that has a different determinant now that is all fine now we have to think about the inverse of the elementary matrices for a purpose that will become clear only in a couple of slides so let's think about the inverse what does an inverse give you inverse basically is the op opposite of what a matrix does if uh, a transposes or translates or transforms x to b then a inverse has to transform b back to x that's what uh, an inverse does okay so that is my golden statement there x gets trans transformed to b by the operation of uh, a now b should get trans transformed back to x by the operation of a inverse so similarly, we have to kind of think about the inverse of the elementary matrices. So if I'm swapping two rows, two and three, what's its inverse? How do I get it back? I have one elementary matrix here. Inverse is the same. I'm going to swap the third and the second row again. If I swap it again, I'll get, get back to my original. All right. So that is my elementary matrix. And its inverse is the same because I'm swapping two rows. I do it twice. I get back to the original. Okay. Is that clear? Is that clear to everybody hoping to see right so it's a simple operation i'm doing the same thing twice i get back to the original swapping two rows okay such matrices for which the inverse is the same as the original uh, these matrices are called involutory i call it by a wrong name yesterday but it's actually called involutory and involution probably means that kind of stuff i don't know what it means but involutory matrix is a is a one for which the inverse is the same as its itself okay now scaling a matrix by uh scaling the second row by four that is the second operation that we looked at so the operation is r2 becomes four times r1 if i want to reverse it what would i do i take the second row and scale it by one fourth okay so that is actually the inverse of the matrix so this is my e2 scaling by second row by four as we saw if i do the inverse I just have to scale the second row by one fourth. So the first row is one of first row, zero of second row, zero of third row. The second row of the product will become zero of the first row, one fourth of the second row, undoing what the original uh, elementary operation did, and then giving back the original version, and then zero of the third row. And the third row stays the same in the product. So that's what it does. Okay. Now subtracting three times the first row from the third. So that was my original uh, elementary operation. The inverse of that will be adding three times the first row to the third one. Okay, so just the op opposite. So that was my elementary operator three. The inverse is just changing the sign of that guy. Okay, now, okay, all right. Now let's talk about a situation whereby we went from A to its row echelon form by just doing the third elementary operation, which, which is scaling and adding. We did not use the swapping and we certainly did not use the scaling of uh, any any row okay so only the third ero third elementary operation so no row exchanges okay 
So the elementary matrices will be of the kind E3 that we saw in the previous slide. They're all lower triangular matrices because you're actually dealing with only the rows that are of such rows so that uh, the things will just yes, subtracting rows above from the rows below. You're never subtracting a row below from a row above or always going down. So it's going to be a lower triangular matrix. You have to think about it a little bit to convince yourself, but it comes from the row picture of matrix multiplication. Now the product of uh, uh, lower triangular matrices is also a lower triangular matrix. This again, you have to convince yourself either by doing examples in sage math or actually writing down a general matrix and doing the product and then seeing it. The proof is very simple, but it's tedious to actually do this in a class. Okay, so you can do it on your own and convince yourself. Easy to do. Just the definition of a matrix product and look at it. The inverse also is a lower triangular matrix as we saw in the case of E3. All you had to do was just same, change the sign of the, the corresponding element. Now, what we will have will be a series of elementary operations, all of the kind, uh, the, the third kind, elementary operations of the third kind, E1, E2, up to EK, okay? All of them are lower triangular matrices. The product also is a lower triangular matrix. Its inverse also is a lower triangular matrix. So I will write A as uh, E inverse times U, because U is my REF, upper triangular matrix. And multiplying that on the left by E inverse on both sides will kill the E on this side, something like E times A is equal to U, U. If I multiply both sides by E inverse on the left, A, that's going to be E inverse U, that is a valid operation. And this guy is just identity matrix. So this is I A is equal to E inverse U and A I times anything is just that, that thing. So A is equal to E inverse U. Now you know that E inverse, so I asked you to convince yourself that E inverse is going to be a lower triangular matrix because each E, each E that went into the, the product was lower triangular. So this can be written as LU. I'm just giving a different name for uh, E inverse, knowing that is a lower triangular matrix, which is what I did here. Okay, so that is the, the famous LU decomposition. Okay, so L is a, uh, it's like a bookkeeping mechanism which keeps track of uh, all the row operations that went into it. Okay, uh, now once you have, what does it mean to say a matrix is lower triangular? That means that the main diagonal and everything, uh, everything above the main diagonal is zero. Everything below can be zero or non-zero. Everything above the main diagonal is zero. That is a lower triangular matrix. So a matrix, a matrix like uh, A, zero, zero, B, C, zero, D, E, F, this is lower triangular, this is a lower triangular matrix. And if it is an elementary operator, this will have the same formula, It'll just have zeros over here. That's all it means. Okay. All right. Now using a back substitution, since U is upper triangular, using back substitution, as we saw, we can get all the, all the variables values. Now U can also be used to get the, the determinant because the third operation, the third ERO does not change the determinant because it's adding or subtracting a multiple of one row from another row that does not change the determinant okay and the determinant of u is very easy to compute because it's just the product of uh, the diagonal elements okay if a pivot is missing then one of the diagonal elements will be zero and that means uh, determinant of a is zero determinant of a being equal to zero is a necessary and sufficient condition for a to be singular singular means non-invertible i am doing two operations here okay to get uh, to kill I have my a here I want to kill this guy and this guy by killing I mean I want to make those guys a zero so I'll take uh, art the second row and subtract twice the first row from it so the set the new second row will become minus two times row one plus the current uh, row two the third row I'll just subtract the first row from the third row okay so that becomes minus r1 plus r3 by looking at it I can write the write down the elementary matrix just by looking at it. I can write that the first row is not changing, so it's got one there. The second row is second row minus two times uh, first row. I have a minus two there. The third row is uh, minus one times the first row. Nothing of the second row and uh, the the third row. Okay. And if I want to do the inverse, I know that I just have to change the signs here. So that will be the same as changing the signs here. So I'll get that. All right. Now I have to do one more elementary operation so that uh, after this after the first elementary operation i get this guy so two became zero 
and uh, one became zero but this guy is a uh, two now because of the operation i have to get rid of that in order to get rid of that i will use the second row okay i'll use the second row so r3 will be two times r2 plus r3 that will get rid of uh, that will make this guy zero so two times r2 plus r3 that will be the new r3 and nothing happens to the first row and the second row so that is just looking at the the operation and writing down the the elementary operator and inverse of that is just a negative sign there and so it's just changing the sign of this guy okay now if i want to know l i will have to take the inverse of uh, e1 and e2 so this also i have to kind of explain so i did two operations on a to get uh, to u so let's do the two operations here do the two operations here i did uh, i took a i multiplied by e1 okay and then i multiplied by e2 so i did two operations in that sequence it is important i have to keep track of the sequence and this gave me u and if i want to find a i have to take these two guys to the other side so i first multiply by e2 inverse so e1 inverse e1 times a is going to be e2 inverse times u and then i want to take uh, e1 also to the other side so a becomes e1 inverse e2 inverse u since matrix multiplication is not commutative the order is important so see that here i had e2 e1 there i have e1 inverse e2 inverse okay so that is a uh, something like the product rule of a uh, uh, matrix inverses also similar to the the transposes okay so if i want to know l i have to take e1 inverse which was here and multiply by that then you will get this this you can verify either using sage math or just by doing it by hand and u is the reduced matrix that you found here so you have u there and if you actually compute the the determinant of a you can verify that that is going to be equal to one times minus one times uh, minus three is going to be three okay so that is a uh, one decomposition but we cleverly avoid doing the row swapping but if you do have row exchanges permutations then we have a bit of an issue because if you look at uh, the permutation matrix they all have determinants plus or minus one so our uh, uh, our computation determinant computation becomes slightly more complicated i'll have to have a plus or minus one okay there was one question from sean for e1 didn't we take two year yeah that is a uh, I actually did two so if, since i had a limited amount of room on the slide i kind of combined them but you could actually do this in a two separate things then you will have e1 e2 e3 you will see the same thing it is the same thing they are kind of independent of each other okay all right so if you have permutations then life becomes a bit more complicated because you have a, a, a sign coming in but you can always write a in the form of a permutation times uh, lower triangular matrix and upper triangular matrix that is the general form okay there is a p l u decomposition but is usually called l u decomposition but this is what's meant by it if you define a and then you type in a l u and this will actually give you three matrices so you have to actually say p comma u comma p comma l comma u equal to this this is a python statement it will give you three matrices p l and u okay all right so p keeps track of row exchanges but remember the row exchanges the matrices are not lower triangular matrices it's uh, you know when you do a row exchange it goes to the other side of the the main diagonal okay but still it is always possible to collect all the permutation matrices together and then have the 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 third kind of uh, row, row operations the scaling and addition kind of row operations and then always possible to group it that way okay and if you had actually used a second elementary row operation also then you, you would have to keep track of that also so that we can scale the final computation using that scaling factor also but if you want to do uh, determinants nobody is going to use a second row operation because uh, that's not needed okay now let me talk a little bit more about the permutation matrices okay if you have in r2 if you want to swap the first row and second row this is the permutation matrix i just swapped i took the identity matrix and swapped the first row and second row its determinant as you can see is a zero minus one it's minus one if i apply this twice i'll get the original one back because i'm swapping the first second row and then swapping it swapping them back again so i'll get the original one back and for that reason its inverse is the same as itself and such matrices are called involutory so it's involutory that is the right word apparently okay similarly in r3 i can have more complicated uh exchanges i can do the first and second second and third and third and fourth 
all those things are involutory because if you do it once more you get back to the original one but the if you do multiple row exchanges it is not involutory if you do it twice you don't get back to the original one but i think if you do it three times you get back to the original one that you can verify this is called uh, it's got a different name names are not that important but uh, the concepts are okay these single permutation matrices are the ones that you will consider in uh, in doing uh, 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 gaussian elimination double permutations are interesting to know but we will not be using it directly if you want to do a double permutation you will do it in two steps two single permutations all right so we did an example of uh, LU decomposition let's do an example of PLU decomposition also where we are doing a row exchange first and then doing the the computation okay so first thing that we did was an exchange of R2 and R3 the elementary operator was that so swapping the second row and the third row and it's inverse itself because it's involutory just doing it once more okay and then we went ahead and did a couple of more operations two operations here but combined into one for the purpose of illustration here so what i in this matrix after the first first operation i have that i have to subtract one of the first row to kill this guy and two of the first row to kill that guy two of the first row one of the first row so minus one two and the diagonal elements are the same and the inverse just change the sign of these two guys so one and two and then you get uh, after the two operations you get uh, upper triangular matrix so uh, ref is done so i have a p and i have an l which is the inverse of uh, e2 the second step here which is that and my u is uh, the upper triangular matrix that i got after the two operations actually three but combined into two okay so that is the plu decomposition multiple row exchanges is not involutory no in general it's not yeah in general it's not but there are special cases you can say that you are doing multiple row exchanges but on the same pair and then it becomes a kind of silly and complicated why did we do this we didn't i did it for illustrative purposes and there's no reason there's no reason why you you would want to do it okay just to illustrate it to you we learned about uh, gaussian elimination as a technique to solving our systems of linear equations gaussian elimination gives you row echelon form which is an upper triangular matrix okay then you can uh, batch substitute and uh, get uh, the solution you can fully solve the system of uh, equations if there is a unique solution it's fairly straightforward if you have infinity of solutions then you have to uh, uh, do a little bit more work there are free variables and then you have to find uh, special solutions and particular solutions and then take uh, linear combinations etc we did one example in class but there are there is uh, one more slightly more complicated example in the textbook with some explanation on the the visualization or the the intuition of what the solution is, looks like so maybe you should go through that to actually to to understand that fully okay now in gaussian uh, elimination we had three types of eros elementary row operations swap rows scale rows which we did not use and add a multiple of one row to another which we use quite a bit uh, gaussian elimination uh, is the same as row reduction it's just another name and it's a process of using these three eros to get to the row echelon form which we defined earlier so the zero rows at the bottom and uh, the first non-zero element in any row is to the the right of the non-zero element in the row above okay so upper triangular matrix another way of saying it now gaussian elimination of uh, the augmented matrix using uh, the eros to get uh, ref will tell you about the solvability conditions if there is no uh, row that translates to zero equal to non-zero then uh, it, the equations are consistent if there is one if there is a zero equal to non-zero row at the bottom of uh, the ref that means there are no solutions you should stop at that point there's no point going ahead nothing is going to change no solutions that's it otherwise you look at the number of non-zero rows in uh, uh, the augmented matrix if it is equal to the number of uh, uh, unknowns which means the number of pivots the rank is the same as the number of unknowns then unique solution then you have just enough uh, independent and consistent equations to solve the system and you have a unique solution very good situation if not you will have an infinity of solution there is no other case these are the three possibilities okay then uh, then we did uh, uh, pivots of a matrix this is the first non-zero element in the ref and rank is a number of pivots and that's it then we did plu did lu first 
and then p will come if you have to do the swapping of rows okay and u will help you compute the the determinant of uh, the original matrix that is the most efficient way of doing it